I don't know about you, but every now and then we get in dark seasons in life. Anybody ever been in a dark season? I don't mean a half hour. I mean, you somehow got down in the darkness and you didn't know which way was up. I remember when I was in college, my parents allowed me to take our family car and drive across the nation for a few weeks with my buddy Johnny. And we camped in all the national parks across America and all the way to the West Coast, up into Northwest uh, America and Canada. And I'm, the day we came to the Grand Canyon was a mind blowing day. Anybody been to the Grand Canyon? Yeah. And, and I don't know if you're like me, but it wasn't enough for me to stand there and look at it. I wanted to go down in it. Anybody? But we hadn't made plans. We hadn't made a reservation. We couldn't get into the campsite at the bottom. So they said, well, you can go down and back in a day, but you can't spend the night. But we don't recommend that because you'll probably die because it's 115 degrees on the way down. And you'll do that down and you'll do that back up. And so we don't recommend that. And we said, well, what, what, what can we do? And this nice person working at the park said, well, you know, the only option I see here is if you go down at night where it's cool, and then you can come out during the daytime. It's like, okay, that sounds like a great plan. So midnight, me and Johnny started down the Bright Angel Trail. It wasn't too bright, didn't see any angels, and it looked a little bit scary, but we started down. And for hours, we just did the switchbacks. We didn't talk a lot, didn't hear anything except the wild donkeys, and they were snorting and kind of, you know, pawing at the ground like they were going to, you know, trample us at any point. We're like, okay, don't know where they are, but we can hear them, can't see them, but that's okay, keep moving. So we keep moving down this tra trail, switchback, switchback, switchback. Hour goes by, two hours go by, three hours go by, four hours go by, and finally we're down in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. We're a mile deep in the earth. I have never seen darkness like the darkness a mile deep in the earth. There is no light making its way from any earth source into this moment. And we arrive, you can hear the, the, the Colorado River trickling by, and it's just dark. You ever been in that place? I knew how we got into that darkness. We chose to start at midnight into a canyon. But there are other times in life where you don't exactly know how you got into the darkness. You're not really sure how you arrived at that place, but all of a sudden, you can't feel God, you can't hear God, you can't see God, and you're not convinced that God can see you, and you certainly aren't convinced that God can hear you, and you start to wonder if God is there, and if he is there, does he even care? Has anybody been in a dark season like that in your life? Well, that's what I want to speak to today. I want to speak today to this idea when God is silent, or when God seems silent, where do we turn, and what do we do when God is silent? There was a time in the history of our faith like that. It's that one big page turn between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In our printed Bibles, it, it goes so easy. We got Malachi, the last prophet in the Old Testament, and then you turn the page. And in my, babe, my Bible, you get a, a header for the New Testament, so you get kind of a free page in there. And then once you turn that page, instantly you're at the Gospel of Matthew. So it takes less than a second to go from the end of the last prophet in the Old Testament to the beginning of the gospel of Matthew and some of the greatest or the greatest news that's ever been brought to humanity before, and it's the turn of a page. But most of you know that in history, that page turn lasts 400 years. From 430 AD to 3 to 5 BC, that's the amount of time that passed from Malachi to Matthew, and in that time, there's no recorded word from God, no recorded prophet, no recorded promise, no recorded voice of God. This intertestamental period, that's the theological term for it, this 400 years of silence, we don't have any record of God talking to his people, and that's not like God. Because when the scripture opens to us and we find ourselves in Genesis 1, nine times it says, and God said. 
And God said, let there be light. And God said, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said. In the very beginning, God was speaking because God is a speaking God. All through the Old Testament, God is speaking to his people, whether it's Moses at a burning bush or whether it's the prophet Isaiah bringing God's word to his people. So God's speaking, he's speaking, he's speaking, he's speaking. And then all of a sudden, radio silence from heaven. And maybe you're in that place today. This word today is for all of us because we all are going to end up in seasons where we don't think God has got anything to say to us. But maybe you're in that season right now. I don't know how you got there. I don't know how they got there. I don't know exactly what transpired to make God want to stop talking for four centuries. But I know a few things can factor into it. It could be if you're in that season, that you just slowly and slightly moved away from God. It's kind of like the shepherd that had the hundred sheep and one of them got lost. I don't think that sheep started a protest against the shepherd. It just slightly and slowly drifted away. Just slightly and slowly got separated from the flock. And maybe that's where you are today. You didn't make a big declaration at any point. You didn't post a tweet that said, hey, just letting everybody know I am walking away from God. But just slightly and slowly over time, you got into a dark place, into a place where it's like, I don't know where God is anymore. And I don't know if God is speaking to my life. It could be that you're in the darkness because God's testing you. Maybe God's allowed you to drift into the darkness to see if your faith is as strong as you think it is, to see if you'll lean into him and seek him, even if you can't feel him and you don't think you can see him. Maybe you got into the darkness because you tuned God out and he just decided he'd stop talking. Married people know what this is like, right? You know, somebody's talking and talking and talking, the other person's not listening, watching TV, looking up occasionally, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh, and then eventually you go, ah, there's no point in this, I'm just gonna stop talking now. And maybe we did that, maybe you did that, maybe you just kinda tuned God out after a minute and he said, okay, I'm just gonna stop talking then, I'll wait until I can get your attention. Or maybe... And I think this is probably more likely the case between Malachi and Matthew. Maybe you just directly disobeyed what God asked you to do. And he decided to stop talking. But maybe more importantly, your disobedience made your heart callous. And even if he was talking, you couldn't hear him anymore. That's the scariest place, by the way, to be in life. Ephesians 4, 19 talks about that place. It says, and these people were so determined to sin and live lives their way that their hearts became callous and they couldn't even hear the voice of God anymore. And maybe that happened to you. I know that Malachi is coming in hot. I mean, if you read these four chapters of this last prophecy, God is really kind of at the tipping point with his people. He's been pointing them towards life. He's been encouraging them to make right decisions. He's been reminding them that they're the people of God, but they are not getting it. They are not going to have it. They're going to do things their own way. And God is about to just say, you know what, guys, if you're going to live like that, then I'm going to let you live like that. Isn't that a scary thought? If you're going to just do it your way, guess what? I'm going to let you do it your way. And for the next 400 years, we'll just see how that goes. It may be that you're in the darkness because you just got distracted by some other noise, or I think a lot of us end up in the darkness because of pain and loss in our lives. Do you know what I'm talking about? Something happens and the pain of it or, or the loss of it or the death of it causes us to create a separation from God. We don't know, why did God do this? Where is God in this? Is God even in this? If God is so great, how is this the situation that we're in? And sometimes that little gap grows into a chasm of grief. And now there is such a great distance between us and God, and it feels like the 400 years of silence in our own life. And I'm not sure, but I would guess somebody along the way started asking the question that maybe you're asking today, and that is, has God given up on us? Maybe after 100 years, somebody had the courage to say, you know what? Do you think he's just 
giving up on us? And maybe you're thinking that today. Maybe you're thinking, is God given up on me? And I just want to encourage you today. The answer to that question is no. God has not given up on you. You say, well, how can you say that? Because I have the story of God's faithfulness in my hands. And even after 400 years, he still had a plan for his people. When you turn the page, you're in Matthew, but Matthew starts with this genealogy of Jesus and then gets us into the birth of Christ. If you turn to Luke's gospel, you get a fuller understanding of what happened when the silence of 400 years was broken. And I want to read part of this story for you. In fact, I actually want to read a lot of it to you. It's the story of the birth of John the Baptist. And this story is where the silence was broken. And it begins with John the Baptist's father and his mother, Zachariah and Elizabeth. And so let me just read it for you. Uh, We're not going to put it on the screen because it's a lot of text, but just a story time, kids, uh, from God's word, a phenomenal and amazing account. It says, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them, catch this, were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. Now, you know, preachers can't read the word of God. They just want to start preaching, so they're always interrupting the word of God. And I'm going to try not to do that except at this one point. (laughs) Notice that there's been no word from God for four centuries. Yet, Elizabeth and Zechariah are observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly, and they're upright in the sight of the Lord. That's a little footnote, spoiler alert. If somebody texts you and you have to run out before the message is over, you got a little something, right? These guys are hanging in there with God, even though nobody's heard from God. But... Here's the hard part of their story. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well along in years. So they were in a generational silence, but they were also in their own personal silence where they'd been praying and seeking and hoping from God. But up until now, nothing. Verse eight says, once... When Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as a priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of the incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, what angels always say, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. To turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true 
at their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he'd stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he'd seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he's shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zachariah. But his mother spoke to him and said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, there's no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak, praising God. And the neighbors were all filled with awe. And throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied in song. When the 400-year silence broke, Gabriel appeared and spoke to Zechariah and fulfilled what Malachi had foretold. So what do you do? If you're in the silence, a few things. Number one, walk by faith and not by feelings. Walk by faith and not by feelings. Second Corinthians 5, 7 says, for we live by faith, not by sight. And so if you can't see or feel and you're not sure that God is even in the equation, that's the moment where you walk by faith. Faith. I love that when the angel arrived, he found Elizabeth and Zechariah upright in their lives, honoring the ways of God, living in the promises of God's word. They were walking by faith and not by sight. They were still on track with God, even though all the markers around them gave them an indication they should bail out at this point. And I'm telling you, we are a generation walking by feelings and not by faith. We are a generation that gets our clues from how we feel. We get our clues from what we just read. We get our clues from the vibes all around us. And then we interpret through those clues our confidence in God versus getting our clues from God and his faithfulness in the past so that we have confidence in him to walk by faith, even if we're not feeling it. That phrase, well, I'm just not feeling it. Well, fantastic. Uh, That's great. Uh, Admit that and let's be honest about it. But not feeling it is a prelude to saying, but I'm going to continue in faithful pursuit of God, even though I don't feel it. There's nothing in this word that says our faith has to be corroborated by our feelings. On the other hand, everything in this word says our feelings will be informed by our faith. The second thing in the darkness is to reorient. And we do that by the word of God. To reorient our lives into the direction God wants us to be going by the word of God. Darkness disorients us. And we don't know exactly which way is up, and we're not really sure if we're up or not. And so how do we figure out if we're up or not? 
We reorient, and how do we reorient according to the word of God? We launched a rocket this week. When I say we, I mean we paid for it, um, a, a big rocket. And the Artemis mission, please tell me, Passion City Church, that you know about Artemis. Can I get an amen on Artemis? Okay, a few people. Um, we're on a new mission to the moon. I know a lot of you don't believe we ever went on the first mission to the moon, and we're praying for you and trusting that God will give you understanding and revelation or lead you to another church home, but we, um, <laughs> we're, on, we're on a new mission to the moon. And so Artemis has launched the, Gen G the Gemini spacecraft on its journey. It's about halfway to the moon right now. And it's going to make a loop around the moon, come back to the earth. And eventually, in a few years, we're going to send people to loop around the moon. And then we're going to send people to the moon. This will be happening in the next few years. Well, Gemini, excuse me, Orion, I'm calling it Gemini. I got my missions mixed up. Orion is the spacecraft, and it's on its way to loop around the moon. And it's being communicated to by the mission controllers to see if it's doing okay. It's taken in some photos. It's inspected itself with cameras. It's all in good shape according to the information we're getting back. But they wanted to know, is the spacecraft oriented right in space? Is it, is it in the right position it needs to be in to really make this journey in the very best way? So it has on board an anomalous star tracker data system. And the anomalous star tracker data system uses these star tracking cameras to take photographs of the sky around the spacecraft. And then it takes the photos of the stars that it just took and it compares them to the map of the starry sky that's in the database on the spacecraft. And instantly then, based on the map of the sky and the photo that it just took, it knows what position the spacecraft is in at that moment. And it can use the thrusters to reorient the spacecraft into the right position to make its journey. And some of you don't know if you're right side up or upside down right now. Some of you do not know if you're in the right position to be getting to where God wants you to go. And you, you can't see, so you don't know. Well, God's word is the internal mapping system that allows us to kind of look around our lives and go, oh, okay, I need to make an adjustment to this. I, I need to orient to God's truth and orient to God's word. I got all kind of crazy thoughts going through my mind right now. I need to get my mind centered around the word of God. I've kind of lost hope in God's plans right now. I need to get my mind centered back around the word of God. I've been coming up with all my own scenarios for how this is going to work. I need to get my mind reoriented and, and to center it around the word of God. The third thing that I would encourage you to do if you feel like you're in a dark place is stay connected to believing people. These dark seasons have a tendency to push us out of community and in dark seasons is when we need community more than ever. See, this is church. We're not all doing okay all the time. Can I get an amen? amen. We're not all in our best day of faith all the time, right? We, we have highs and lows in our faith. Some days we're uber confident in God, and some days we're down in that dark pit going, I don't know what God's doing, and I don't even know if there is a God. And this is church. So we're not all walking through the door going, hey, let's put our happy face on and our I'm doing great face on and everything's amazing face on. No, come as you are. And if you're low, maybe you'll be in a row with somebody that's high. And if you're high, then maybe you'll be on a row with somebody that's in a low. If you're feeling the strength of God's spirit in your sail, awesome. Maybe you'll be sitting on a row with somebody who needs to get on your boat. This is church. It's when we're honest with each other and we realize that God's put us in community. I love this. It's just a small footnote in the story, but it says when Zachariah's division was on duty, he was serving as a priest before God. The whole company of priests that he was connected to, it was their turn to serve. It was their time to move. It was their time to be in the temple. Therefore, moving with community, Zechariah was there. He was in a dark season uh, generationally, but he and, and Elizabeth were in a dark season personally, but he was still in church because his people were in church that day. 
So become a door holder at Passion City Church and keep showing up with your door holder team when you're in a high or when you're in a low. When you feel it and when you don't feel it, keep showing up with the people of God. Get in a connect group. Get around some people of faith and stay around the believing people. That's where you need to be in the dark season of life. The fourth thing is, if you're in that season, I just want to encourage you to worship God in the dark season of silence. You're like, well, that doesn't make any sense at all. You worship God like Zachariah did once you realize, oh, we're having a boy, and bam, he just was born. And now I'm going to call him John like I was supposed to do, and the angel showed up and told me that God had done something amazing, and now I can talk again, and the first thing I'm going to do when I can talk again is praise God. That all makes sense. But I want you to notice that Zechariah didn't just erupt in praise the moment that his mouth was opened and his son was born and this incredible promise and prophecy was spoken over his son, John. He was worshiping God and praising God in the barren day before the angel even arrived. When God broke 400 years of silence, he found Zechariah at the altar burning incense of worship to his God. He was worshiping in the 400 years of silence. He was stoking the fires of worship so that a fragrance could rise up to the throne of God. In the wondering, he was worshiping and praising God. His name, I was reminded this week, Zachariah, means the Lord remembers. And God wants you to hear that today. God remembers you. He hasn't forgotten about you. He hasn't forgotten about your story, about what he promised, about the plans that he's gotten for your life. He hasn't forgotten all that. But what I loved about this text is not only does God remember Zachariah, but Zachariah remembers God. Zechariah remembers Yahweh. Zechariah didn't forget God, even though no one had heard from him for 400 years. He still remembered the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And that same God is your God. Do you remember him today? Do you remember today? Are you cognizant today of the fact that your God is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of Malachi and the God of Matthew, the God of Zechariah and the God of Elizabeth, the God of Mary and the God of Joseph, the God of the ages is your God. So worship him today, even in the silence. Why should I worship him in the silence? Because when you worship him in the silence, there is a song and now the quiet has been broken. You can just say, man, I don't know where God is and I don't hear anything. I don't see anything. And I'm just in the dark over here. Or you can light a light and you can light a fire and you can burn incense to God. And you can use your voice to say, even in the dark, God, I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know how you're doing it. I don't even know if you're doing it, but I know this. I know you are a good God who's given everything you have for me. Therefore, even in this silence, I'm gonna offer incense to you. Number five, just two more of these. To believe in hope, this is what you do when you're in the dark that what God has said, he will do. Anybody believe that today? I can't see it. I don't know. Not adding up, but I believe God's gonna do what he's gonna do. In Malachi, he said a couple of things specifically. I love this. In chapter three, verse one, he said, see, I'll send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. In the very last verse, before radio silence, Can you imagine the the weight of this verse? Not going to talk for a while, so might want to hang on to this one. He says, see, I'll send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. I'm going to send a messenger. He'll prepare the way for me. 
I'm gonna send the prophet Elijah before the terrible day comes and he's gonna turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Turn the page, Gabriel shows up. Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God? Just goes, what is the assignment? Zechariah, where will I find him? In the temple in worship? He'll be the one offering the incense? Got it, and what's the message? That you've heard his prayer and you're gonna answer his prayer and you're gonna give him a son? Oh, but not just any son, this son's gonna be, what kind of son? Okay, okay, and what's he gonna do? Okay, okay, great, wow, whew, man, hope he's ready, that's quite a word. Whoosh. Zachariah, my name's Gabriel. I was just standing in the presence of God. I've got a word for you. Can I just encourage you? If God brings you a word like that today, say thank you. Don't say, oh, I don't know how that's gonna happen. Because the next thing you'll be like. <laughs> and for nine months, you're gonna be making hand gestures and drawing on paper. If, if God brings you a word today, say thank you. You're like, but Louie, I don't know. I know, but don't say that part. Just, just don't know. And say, thank you. <laughs> he will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. God is gonna do what he said he's gonna do. And in the dark, you have a choice to say, I believe it. No, I can't explain it. No, I can't make sense of it. No, I can't see it. But I'm choosing to believe that my God is gonna do what he said he's gonna do. And he's not just gonna do what he said he's gonna do. He's gonna do it in a better way than I could even imagine. All they wanted was a child. And I'm sure in this culture, they wanted a son. But God said, not only are you gonna have a child, not only are you gonna have a son, you're gonna have a son who's gonna be favored by God in the spirit of Elijah. He's gonna go before the Lord and prepare the way for Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is gonna announce the coming salvation of God and the mercy of God and the work of God to bring people into a relationship with him. Your son is gonna be John the Baptist. He's going to be amazing. He's going to be one of the most powerful figures in the church. He's going to be preached about thousands of years from now. Not only are you going to get what you want, you're going to get more than you want. Yes. And you have a choice today. Listen, I, I'm not minimizing the darkness, but you have a choice today. And then the last thing is, I just encourage you to press into the silence. Don't despise it. Don't try to figure it out. Don't try to understand it. Just press into it with a renewed focus to hear from God. There's few prayers more mighty than God. I don't know where you are or what you're doing, but I want to hear your voice and I'm listening. We got down to the bottom of that trail. And I'm telling you, it, <laughs> it's weird when you're a mile down in a crevice. And we decided we'd lay down and sleep for an hour or two until sun came up. And so we laid down on the sandy beach right as the Colorado River made a big turn 
And somehow we'd been focused on every step. That's what you do when you're going down the bright angel trail in the middle of the night and their wild donkeys over there snorting at you. You watch every step. You make sure of every step. Your focus is on every step. But then we laid down and we looked up. Oh my word, it was if I could reach out and pluck a star out of the sky with my hand. It was so dark, the stars felt like they were gonna fall on us. I'd never seen stars so bright and I believe based on God's word and my journeys through dark nights of the soul that there is a Gabriel coming and the darkest silence is going to make God's promise brighter than you've ever seen it before. Maybe today you need to change your gaze from making sure I can make it every step to just looking up and going, whoa, that's so much brighter than it was when we were up at the rim, somehow down in this pit, down in this hardship, down in this darkness, your goodness, your mercy, your promise, your hope, your heart, your hand, they're brighter than I've ever seen them before. Thank you, God, for lifting my gaze up to see you. But I wanna call you today, I wanna call us today to worship. Not when God comes through and he's coming through, he has and he will. And when he does, we're gonna worship him. Of course we will. But I wanna invite you today to worship him now. Maybe you're in the pain, the loss, the death, the hardship. Maybe you're surrounded by a situation that just has blocked everything out of you. I'm telling you, in that moment today, you can still light incense to heaven. You can still raise a song of praise to heaven. It just might be as simple as a hallelujah. But if a hallelujah is all you've got, give him a hallelujah today and see if it won't change your heart in the middle of the silence. Or maybe you disobeyed him, and today it's about repentance. It's about going, no wonder I haven't heard from God. The last time he talked to me, I did the exact opposite of what he asked me to do. And he just said, okay, go with that. Or maybe you just somehow tuned him out. He became an option for you, like I had coffee with a friend, and I did some research online, and I came up with some ideas of my own, and I asked God. I had four good ideas going, and he was a good idea but he's, he's not the idea. He's not the voice. He's not the go-to for you. Or maybe you just slightly and slowly just drifted away. I'm telling you today, there's power in turning our hearts back towards God. There's power today in knowing no matter what the darkness, you can light the incense of worship. And there could be thousands of voices in our house today on the mountaintop singing his praise. And he loves that. But I'm telling you, if 10 voices from the valley low lifted a song of praise today, all of heaven will lean in and go listen to them. They're praising God even in the silence. They are not silent.